Well, to those of you who were here, the first presentation, welcome back. And those of you who weren't here, welcome. <laughs> I'm glad to, to have some more faces. <laughs> and uh, it looks like there are some who've been, who are missing, some uh, uh, familiar faces that I don't see today. They must be somewhere else. Well, in our first presentation, we spoke about the Day of Atonement, as it is presented in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And from there, we saw how the symbols prophesied the great reality that came with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I get excited when I see things like that in the Scriptures, when I see the beauty and the knowledge of God, and then I see it fulfilled so perfectly, so beautifully. It gives me assurance, doesn't it? That, that, that which is yet to come is sure, is sure it will come. Amen? As everything has been fulfilled, that which is left, it will also be fulfilled. And therefore, we can walk with assurance. I'd just like to tell you that um, I'll, I'm, I'll be going to Chile at the end of the year. Uh, not the end of the year, the end of the month. The 22nd of November, we, my family, my wife, my son, myself are traveling to Chile to uh, run an evangelistic program uh, in Chile. Then uh, we're going to Uruguay to run an evangelistic program. And then we travel to Bolivia to uh, uh, record there for uh, an, a Spanish uh, television network, Adventist Spanish television network, that they need a desperate need for Spanish uh, material. So I can speak Spanish, so I'm going to go there and spend a week with them. So I'd like, I'd like uh, to invite you to, to pray for us and uh, keep us in your prayers. Uh, we've been investing a fair bit in these programs and uh, the Lord will manifest himself in Chile. One of the Bible workers we are supporting has already almost 50 Bible studies. Uh, people ready for baptism and they, it's a small town we are going to, but the church is enthusiastic. They are, they are working very hard and we are expecting the Lord is going to do great things. But you see, evangelism is not about the evangelist. Evangelism is about the, the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the work of the Spirit will only come in answer to prayer. So I would like you to keep us in your prayers. Uh, and seriously pray for us so that the Lord will use us mightily. We will see Him at work in our midst. <clears throat> we will have the joy of seeing many, many people uh, give their lives to the Lord. Next time I come, it will be next year, probably, I don't know when, probably February, March. I'll, uh, we are coming back at the end of January. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll inform what the, hell, what the Lord did and how He blessed and, and how he manifested himself. Well, before, before we keep uh, uh, preaching and talking on God's word, why don't we bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, we have such an amazing privilege to draw so near you and to know that you, the King of the universe, has an attentive ear to your children here on earth, and that, Lord, we raise our prayers and you answer them so swiftly. And we thank you and praise you, Father, for the wonderful gift of prayer. As we continue to consider the subject of the Day of Atonement and the Judgment, as we look at our life in the light of these things, we pray that your Spirit, Father, will speak with convicting power to our souls that you will open up our eyes, that we may see, Lord, the areas in our life that we need to surrender, that we need to give to Jesus. For time is short. The end of all things is coming. Soon Jesus will leave the sanctuary to come to take his children back home. And Father, we want to be found right. But we do not know, we are ignorant. Therefore, Lord, as little children, we sit at your feet and we pray, Daddy, please teach us. Give us a heart that is attentive, a mind that is sharp, and a spirit that is willing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When we think of judgment, we usually react to judgment negatively. You know, if you think that you have to go to court, you got a court order, a summons, you go, wow, why? We, we tend to have a negative perspective of judgment. And the Bible says that all of us 
shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So whether you've trusted in the Lord or you haven't trusted in the Lord, you and I will have to one day give account to the Lord for the deeds in the body. And when we hear that, we do not like it. You see, friends, we human beings have come to an age in which we do not want accountability. So much so that we have created an idea that there is no God. We have created a whole thing called evolution to, you know, to conclude there is no God. And if there is no God, there is no judgment. Therefore, I can live my life as I want to live, do what I want, mess up as I want to live. And at the end, I have to give account to no one. Well, the Bible cracks that idea in half and says very clearly that God has set his throne for judgment. Judgment, as a matter of fact, according to prophecy, has already begun in heaven. And one day, you and I will give an account for everything we've done to God. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing hidden. And as we looked at today, this, you know, just in the previous presentation, Christ has begun a work of judgment cleansing in heaven. But the purpose of the, of the atonement that is taking place in heaven, the word of the day of atonement, is not to destroy God's people. Some people think, oh, Jesus did everything possible for us to save us in Calvary. And now the judgment, we imagine that God is looking for excuses to condemn us. It's, that's not the case. In the Bible, judgment is good news. In the Bible, the judgment is part of the gospel. Amen? That's why in the Day of Atonement in Leviticus, Calvary and what happens in the most holy place are together. They are linked. They are one event. One cannot happen without the other. Amen? And so what we really want to know is what must I do so that when my name comes in the judgment, I will have no fear. Don't you reckon that that's a fair question? Yes or no? Tell me something. <laughs> you have to respond to a South American, otherwise we can get a heart attack here at the front. <laughs> it's a fair question. What must I do to be ready for the judgment? Really, friends, the question, many times we talk about being ready for the second advent of Jesus. That is not our concern. We must know how to be ready for the judgment. If you're ready for the judgment, you have no problems with the second coming of Jesus. Amen? And so that's what we're going to, we, we are going to look at today. Come with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Again, we're going to look at the Old Testament and allow the Old Testament through symbols to teach us about the great reality. Leviticus, chapter 23. I'll come first to Leviticus 16, and we'll take verse 29 onwards. And then we'll read Leviticus 23. It says this, This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your soul. And do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. and You shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. I want you to notice that as Moses describes what is to happen in the Day of Atonement, then he comes to the end of the Day of Atonement and he centers on the people and Moses clearly teaches the, the Israel that as the Day of Atonement is happening, God expects of his people a work happening in their own lives in response to the work the priest is doing in the sanctuary. Did you notice that? And Leviticus 23 actually 
is more descriptive than Leviticus 16 regarding the work that needs to happen in response to the work of the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll read from verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. In all your dwellings, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, evening you shall celebrate your Sabbaths. So as we look at those verses, we find that the children of Israel, in response to the experience of the Day of Atonement, had to go through or uh, partake a five-fold experience. There were things, five things they needed to do in response to what was happening inside the sanctuary and being done by the high priest. And these things were, first, it was a holy convocation. Number two, they were to afflict their souls. Number three, they were to offer an offering made by fire. It was a burnt offering. Number four, they were to do no work. And number five, it was for them a Sabbath of solemn rest. What would happen if the children of Israel did not respond in this way to the Day of Atonement? What was the result of it? If they did not participate in the Day of Atonement in this way, they would be cast out of Israel. They would be destroyed from the congregation of Israel. So how serious was for the children of Israel to be ready for the Day of Atonement? It was very serious. Don't you reckon? Did you know that Jews today, even today, take the Day of Atonement very seriously? I've got a friend who's Polish. His name is Ziggy. And we go together to Poland to run evangelistic programs. And Ziggy is a handyman. He does all kinds of work. And he works for a few Jews in Melbourne. And Jews, they're nice people. I, I am a Jew, so I can talk about it. And they're nice people, but they're stingy. <laughs> And so they, it's hard. they want you to do work for them, but it's very hard to open their hands so that they will pay. But Ziggy has no problem. He waits for them and accumulates the bills, accumulates the bills. And Ziggy looks in the Jewish calendar. When is the Day of Atonement coming? <laughs> and when he finds out, then a couple of weeks before, he goes and visits them and says, Isaac, you need to pay. You, know, you, know, you owe me so much. And Isaac says, oh, Ziggy, I don't have any money, but Isaac, he says, Isaac, the Day of Atonement comes. He says, oh, Ziggy, come, come on Friday and I'll have the money ready for you. <laughs> Why? Because in the Jewish, in the Orthodox Jewish mindset, they know that the Day of Atonement is the Day of Accounts. And you must be right with one another and right with God. And so in order to be right for the Day of Atonement so that the, the Jew would not lose his place in Israel, God gave them five experiences they needed to go through in order to be ready. And that's what we are going to study today because this is symbolic of the experience that God's Israel of today must experience in order to be ready when Jesus calls our name in heaven. Amen? Amen? How can I be sure that when Christ calls Sam Braga, I, I'm going to tell you a dream that my brother had. 
Brother Antonio is my, my second and eldest brother. I was running an evangelistic program in his, in his church a couple of years ago. And uh, my brother, for many years, has been very legalistic. And the Lord has changed him a lot. And, and, and the experience began in those evangelistic programs where I preached righteousness by faith. And my brother had a dream. He dreamed that he was in the judgment. And he, was, and he dreamed that he was standing in front of uh, the court and God was sitting on his throne and the angels were there. There was a book open right in front of him and his name was right there. And he called, they called his name Antonio Braga. And he was an old man. He was just looking down. He felt ashamed because the moment they called his name, shame took hold of him, on himself. And they began to read his life from the moment he was a little child. And there were things that he, they began to say that he, they, he had forgotten. He, he did not remember. And yet they were there. And as they read them, they started popping out real things that had happened to my brother. And everything they read it was true, true. And, and he, he could not lift up his eyes because he was ashamed to recognize that it was true. At the end of the judgment, they said, have you got anything to say? He was silent. He knew he was lost. Everything they had said, thoughts, intentions, words, actions, was all true. And it all condemned him. Remind me to finish the dream at the end of the... Because being, being a bragger, I forget. But I'm going to leave the second half of the dream towards the end. What would happen if your name is called in heaven today? Where does your assurance rest? Well, in these five experiences, if you experience these five things, in your life, you will have assurance and you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that your name will go through the judgment without any problems. First, is a holy convocation. What is a holy convocation? Two words, holy means that it's set apart. There's nothing more important. This thing is the most important thing that is happening. Amen? And a convocation is a gathering together. For the children of Israel, when the Day of Atonement came, there were three times when they went to Jerusalem. One of them was the Feast of, uh, you know, the, uh, of the Day of Atonement. They left everything aside, absolutely everything. There was nothing more important. There was nothing more crucial. They left it all aside and they went to Jerusalem. It was a time when all gathered together. And that teaches us a number of things. Why did they gather together? They gathered together on the Day of Atonement. They came around the temple because they knew that there was a man who had been chosen from among them who was representing them before God. In a sense, was the substitute, was their representative. And they gathered together because they all had the same concern, did they? They had left business. They had left aside their differences. They stopped arguing. Now this, everything fell into insignificance. The most important thing was to follow by faith that high priest who was representing them before God. True? True? Remember, I'm a South American. I'm a Jew, but South American, and I need response. And so what does it mean for us that it is a holy convocation? Dear friends, in this very moment, Jesus is ministering on our behalf before the Father. And he has been chosen from among us. He is our elder brother. Amen? Amen. He loves us so much that he has died for us. Praise the Lord. He bears us in his own DNA. He carries Sam. And as he goes into the presence of the Father, in a sense, he is taking me with him. But he cannot represent him, represent me, if I am not intimately interested and connected with him in the work he's doing for me. And let me tell you, dear friends, Satan has created a myriad distractions for human beings. 
I was traveling yesterday in the train because, well, you know, the car I usually travel is uh, broken down and, and I was looking at people and I fall on it. You know, I remember in the old days, you know, we travel in train, no one had mobile phones. Everyone was either looking at paper or we were talking. Have you seen people in the train or the buses today? What are they doing? No one talks. Everyone is preoccupied. There is so many things that are calling our attention. Jobs, studies, uh, family, uh, mortgages, cars. So many things, internal, out, external problems. So many things. Why is Satan crowding our minds so much? Why is there so many things calling our attention? So much stuff that is saying, come on, come on, come on. Follow me, follow me. Why? Because of one reason, Satan doesn't want you to who your attention to the man in heaven who's representing you. Because if you are not interested, if you are not connected with him, Jesus cannot take you into the presence of the Father and say, he is mine. And so the first message of the Day of Atonement in regards to our preparation is looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Follow him by faith into the most holy place. We should be spending a thoughtful hour every day following Christ from his childhood all the way through to the end of the controversy. How do you think that God has shown me the things that I've shared with you today? It's not because I read theologians. It's because I follow the Lord and at every step I ask the question, what does that mean? How does that apply to Christ? How does it apply to me? It is the privilege of every Christian to have a rich experience in spiritual things. But the reality is that most of us are dwarfs in spirituality. True? It's a holy convocation. Dear friends, let me ask, is there anything in this world that is more important than your preparation for the moment that your name comes through the judgment? Anything more important? A holy convocation not only meant to follow the priest or the high priest in the most holy place by faith in the days of the, 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 the Old Testament sanctuary when, when they were in the wilderness. They could actually hear the high priest walking inside with those bells ringing in his, in his garments. And he, they knew that they had someone representing him by faith. You and I can look into the most holy place of the sanctuary and know, know that you and I have have a high priest. But also meant that the children of Israel, as they left their places of residence and they came to Jerusalem, as a, as a matter of fact, the very physical act of coming to Jerusalem forced them to become united, close to one another, intimately linked to one another. Yes, there was one objective that moved them and motivated them. It was the high priest in the most holy place. Amen. And dear friends, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, Paul applies this principle when he, even he says, the way we are to relate to one another because we have a high priest. Chapter 10 of, and verse 19. Chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, verse 19, the apostle says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, Verse 20, by a new a living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our bodies washed having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as it is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Did you notice the applications? What does Paul say? The gathering together means that you and I must seek for opportunities to fellowship together. We should be gathering together to pray. We should be gathering together to study the Bible. Sabbath comes. This place should be full because here we gather together. Amen. 
It is important for us to gather together personally with our Savior, but we must gather together as a body looking by faith into Christ. How, how did the church respond in the book of Acts when they knew that Christ had gone to the heavens and it was in the heavenly sanctuary for them? How did they respond? They gathered together. How often? Every day. We must forsake, abandon our differences. We must learn to love one another. We must strengthen the weak. We must put our arms around those who are struggling. Friends, it is the day of atonement, dear friends. It is the final act. You and I one day soon will be, will be either saved or condemned. And it is our dream, it is our desire that everyone in this church must make it across the line. Don't you reckon? And in the Christian life, no one makes it alone. In the Christian life, we must walk together. Amen? Amen. In Western Christianity, there is this sense of, oh, I, I must stand alone. I, you know, it's this thing, self. Dear friends, when you look at the Bible, and it's a body. Amen? And therefore, the Day of Atonement demands unity, not uniformity but unity amongst the believers. So the Day of Atonement is here. What if your name came before God the Father tomorrow and you hate someone? You have a spirit of unforgiveness. You haven't learned to love your enemies. What are we going to do, friends? Can we stand before the judge of the universe and excuse ourselves? Will any excuses clear us? No, friends. Seek those who hate you. Seek those whom you hate. Seek your enemies and reconcile us for forgiveness. Make things right. Pay your debts. Seek for those whom you have done wrong and do them right. Make things right. That's the first message of the, of the, of the Day of Atonement. Be one with your Savior who is working in the sanctuary. Be one with one another. Let true unity exist. The greatest work as a church as a church that is worldwide, over 20 million Adventists who, who are facing fragmentation in so many areas, our most desperate need is unity. If we are going to face the final hours of human history, we are not going to do it as individuals. We must do it as body. There's no strength when only one stands, but there is strength when the body stands. Amen? Amen. The spirit of criticism, the spirit of, of independence, the spirit of thinking by myself better than others, holier than thou, is, this is Satan's spirit. Amen? Oh, there's so much to say, but I must keep moving. Second experience. In Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, oh sorry, Leviticus 23, the, 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 the prophet writes, in verse 27, also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, a gathering together, a seeking for unity in order to follow our high priest who is in the most holy place. Amen. How important is this? It's the most important work. Number two, you shall afflict your souls. What is number two? You tell me. We, have, we must afflict our souls. That's it. That's why seven day Adventists are such sad people. We laugh like this. Well, they've been, they've, they taught us we need to afflict our souls. What does it mean to afflict? Come with me to the book of Psalms and let us learn how they did it in those days. Psalms chapter, chapter 35 and verse 13. Psalms chapter 35 and verse 13. 
The word to afflict literally means to humble yourself. Psalms chapter 35 and verse 13. That's what I said, didn't I? Psalms 35 verse 13 says this, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humble. That word humble is the same word translated afflict. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. I want you to notice what, what the, the, the experience of, of humbling yourself, of afflicting yourself required three things. It was in those days, to dress yourself in sackcloth, to fast, and to pray. In other words, friends, as we, as we come to the last moments of the Day of Atonement that you and I are living, the Lord is calling His people to humility. Remember what Jesus says, he said to his disciples, take up my yoke upon you and learn of me that I am gentle and lowly in heart. When you come to Christ, when you make the decision that you will follow him where he is, by faith you will trust him, by faith you will, de- you, you, you will follow him in the most holy place, then Jesus says to you, okay, but now you must join me, you must become one with me. You can't do this thing alone, you must join me in this work, and in order to do that, you and I must become one through an experience of being yoked up together. And the yoke is... It's an instrument of pairing. I don't know whether you've seen two oxen working the fields and they are yoked up. Have you seen them? Two animals that were independent from one another under the yoking experience have become one and under that yoking experience now they they accomplish a common work together. Amen? And Christ says, come, be yoked up with me. In order to do that, I must surrender. I must abandon. I must turn in my independence. You see, dear friends, in the kingdom of God, there is much freedom. But there is no independence. In God's kingdom, nothing is independent from anything else. We have much freedom, but we are all dependent on one another. And we are dependent on God. But sin has made you think. Sin has created in us the belief, I can do it. And I can do it by uh, by my own strength. Oh man, I'm strong enough. I will accomplish it. And in this world in which we live, I is supreme. Self is everything. Yes or no? We have come to an age in history, friends, where self is king. And I live to satisfy that self. And the gospel on the other side says, the day of atonement says, you must not exalt yourself, you must humble yourself. But because Jesus knows that for us it's impossible to humble ourselves, Jesus says, come and join me, take up my yoke, and I will teach you to be lonely in heart like I am. And the Bible speaks of that experience. As the cross, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In other words, the call of the day of atonement is a call to humility. It's a call, dear friends, to renounce self. It's a call to abandon my opinions, my self-importance. My desires, my wishes, my will must all be surrendered at the foot of Christ so that he will be the one who lives and not us. Amen? Amen. Dear friends, true humility is the only basis of true unity. 
As long as we think that we know it all and I know the best color of the carpet and I know what this text says and I know that you're wrong and I know this and that, there's no, there's no unity but difference. Two unity is based on the fact in the realization that you and I are in the same hole and we must work together to get out of this thing. That experience of humbling ourselves before the Lord is an internal experience. It's an experience of coming to the recognition that there is nothing you can offer God. That you are bankrupt in regards to anything that you can offer God for Him to accept you. There is nothing that you will ever do to earn it. The first thing that God does in the process of salvation is to actually humble human beings. Because Society has taught us that we must work to earn a living, that we must earn to work a reputation, that we must work in order to be accepted, to be valued. God says you cannot, in my kingdom, you cannot work to earn my love. In my kingdom, you cannot work to earn my acceptance. In my kingdom, you must abandon your work and then I will accept you. And that humbles us. True? That destroys our pride, our self-sufficiency, and our self-exaltation. Because rather than coming like the Pharisee to Jesus and say, Lord, thank you so much, I, I am such a good guy. We must come like the, the, the tax collector and say, Lord, be merciful to me, for I am a great sinner. An internal work that it will give fruit on an external work. I want you to notice the way they did it. They came to the sanctuary humbled. The Lord required a soul humility. But they expressed it in the way they dressed. And in the way they ate. For the day they did not eat. And they dressed themselves in sackcloth. Sackcloth was the, 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 the lowest form of dress. It was a dress you used when you were in deep sorrow. And the Lord says to his people, when you come to the Day of Atonement, when did the Day of Atonement begin? From 1844 onwards. True? So according to this, if the Lord is requesting his people to have a special experience of humbling himself, themselves before the Lord, then... From 1844 onwards, he should be also teaching his people how to eat and how to dress. Interesting. Did you know that Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, he was afflicting himself and he fasted. You and I cannot fast every day. So what has the Lord given us in order for us to fast in the day of atonement? He has given us a very simple diet. That's why Adventism teaches a diet. We call it uh, uh, diet reform. It's not for you to think that through this you will enter heaven. It's so that you can have an external experience that says, I am denying my own appetites. I will not even please myself in the things that I like because I, am, I have prepared myself for the Lord to search my heart. And you know, in Daniel chapter 10, there were three things that Daniel stopped using when he was afflicting himself. He stopped eating meat, he stopped drinking alcohol, and he ate no food that was pleasant to his eyes. Amazing. Why do you think that God has called Adventists to eat a simple diet, to give up meat, to stop drinking alcohol, and to dress in a way that goes against the ways in which the world dresses. It's not, a, it's not a popular message. It's not because we are going to earn salvation through this thing. And because that earns me brownie points before God. No, it's because the Lord is saying to his people, I want you to humble yourself before me. I want you to strip yourself from your glory. In the days of judgment in Israel, Israel will clear itself from jewelry. And so what I'm saying here, sadly in Adventism, we've taught these things as an identity thing. If you're vegetarian, if you do not wear jewelry, if you do not drink wine, you are a good seventh-day Adventist. That destroys the whole purpose of this. It makes you proud. 
The purpose of these things is to lead us to repentance, humility, and abandoning of self in order to hook on to Jesus. Can you see it? But as pride and independence grows among us, so does the way we eat and the way we cover ourselves. The Day of Atonement demands that God's people experience repentance. That we search our hearts, not to look to self, but the way we search our hearts like Daniel does in Daniel chapter 9, Lord, be merciful to us. Forgive our sins. The confession of what we have done wrong, friends. To go to the Lord and say, Dear Father, please search my heart. Open my eyes that I may see in which ways I'm walking in rebellion against you. Not because, dear friends, that will cause us to walk in doubt and not, not, no assurance. The opposite when the Lord convicts of sin and he opens our eyes to our wickedness and you respond to Christ, then fullness of assurance comes. John says that we will not fear the judgment. It is the privilege of every Adventist to know that if our name goes through the judgment tonight, Christ will represent me. Amen? Amen. Third experience. I wish I could talk more about this, but I need to run. Third experience. And I get excited. Each experience really is a, is a, is a deepening in the work of righteousness by faith. Turn away from yourselves is the message. Look to Christ. Become one with one another. Humble yourselves. Lower yourself that the Lord may exalt you one day. Is the message. Did you know that the three angels' messages carry exactly the same message? Exactly the same call comes from the first angel's message. Worship God, fear Him, give Him glory. Come to chapter 23 of Leviticus again and the third experience. You shall afflict yourselves, and notice what it says now, an offer, an offering made by fire to the Lord. I want you to notice what it says here. It says that as we, as we enter into the, 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 the most holy place experience, as we enter into the day of atonement, the Lord says, the third experience I want you to have is that you offer an offering made by fire. Who is the offering? Literally, not symbolically. It's Christ. Amen? Amen. And what is the altar that the offering needs to be offered on? It's Calvary. Amen? So what is the Lord saying to Seventh-day Adventists? I do not want you, he says, to make your experience those things that you are doing in order to humble yourself, even the experience of humility. I don't want you to concentrate on it. I want you to put your eyes on the sacrifice. Let Calvary become your focus point. Let there be the place where you find assurance, joy, Victory, righteousness, cleansing, forgiveness, power, Calvary's cross. Did you remember this, morning, this afternoon as we talked about the Day of Atonement? Remember that I told you that in the Day of Atonement, Calvary is preeminent. It is even more important than the most holy place. Twice the most holy place comes, comes into view. The altar of sacrifice four times. And when we are going through the Day of Atonement, God wants us to be Christ-centered. Let me ask you a question. How do you find an assurance of acceptance before God? And I don't want you to think in your mind theologically, I want you to think in your mind experientially. How do you find an assurance before God? What is it? I often ask Adventists, if Christ came tonight, will you go to heaven? And you know what Moses said? Ah, 
I don't know. The Lord is saving me. I don't really know. Paul said in the book of Hebrews, because we have a high priest, we can have fullness of assurance in faith. Why is it that we do not have assurance? Why, friends? It's not a boastful assurance, but the Christian, he who who has Christ in his heart, will have an assurance that he is accepted. Amen? How do you find that assurance? We tend to measure ourselves by by our deportment, by our actions. Well, if the, the past week... I didn't watch movies, and the past week I didn't eat cheese, and the past week I didn't look at girls. Then, whoa, this, this week I'm a good Adventist. And the preacher preaches about the second coming of Christ, and you sit in the church and say, Come on in a hurry, Lord, because the week that came was a good week. Come on, come on, come. <laughs> True or not? But you had a bad week, you ended flat. Whom Satan kicked you and dragged you. And then you come, second coming sermon. No, Lord, please do not come yet. Because, oh, I haven't even gotten married yet. <laughs> True. What, how do we find assurance before the Lord? Dear friends, according to the Day of Atonement, there's only one place for assurance. It's not the most holy place. It's Calvary. Amen? Do you want to know that you have salvation? Go to Calvary. And do not move from Calvary until you have assurance that in Christ and because of his work, because of his spilled blood, God has given you his righteousness. Amen? Amen? Seventh-day Adventists and visitors and friends who are in our midst. It doesn't matter who you are. None of us have an advantage to heaven. All of us can come to Calvary, look at Calvary, fall in love with our Savior, and give Him everything. And it is Calvary, the center of our assurance. Amen? doesn't matter how far you've gone, how wicked you are. doesn't matter what you're dealing with, what has you by the neck. doesn't matter what sins you're struggling with. You come to Calvary. You accept Christ. You accept declare him your savior and the Lord gives you assurance that when the day of atonement comes for you and your name passes through the judgment you will go through the judgment clear it's impossible to be saved trusting in Jesus did you hear that isn't that good news I wish we could say hallelujah But it's a typical one of our responses. Let's go back to verse 28. I want you to notice that that what really the the, the day of atonement teaches us is righteousness by faith. Have you noticed that? That's the theological word. What what is the simple way of saying it? Oh, What the, the day of judgment is saying is, guys, if you do not have my righteousness, I can do nothing for you. How can I have that character of Jesus? Go to Calvary. And there you will have it. Forget about everything else the world is trying to do with you. Forget about the things that are consuming you. Give the work of preparation the first place. Prayer meetings, come man. Bible studies, go. Let's give the opportunity to be together. First opportunity. Cancel everything else, friends. Oh, but Pastor Sam, I've got mortgages. Oh, friends, wouldn't it be better to lose your house than to lose your salvation? But so many are exchanging Christ for a car, for a job, for a bank account. Dear friends, if you're serious about Jesus, put it all on the altar. And give Christ the first place. In Australia, the church is dwindling. Not because there are souls who do not want to hear about Jesus. It is because there are no Christians who are really willing to sacrifice at all for the salvation of the lost. Leave it all aside. Come to Christ. Give Him first place. Humble yourself before Him. Follow His rules. Surrender yourself. Search your heart. And cease to look at yourself Turn to Calvary. And notice the next counsel. 
he says, verse 28, And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement. Well, we can all go on the door. Imagine he's saying that we don't have to work. Well, that's not physical. For them it was one day. For us it may be all our life. And the Bible clearly says, six days you shall labor. Among Christians, they shouldn't be a lazy person. True? So what does that mean? Didn't Paul say, for by the works of the Lord, no one shall be justified. What is he saying here? Cease from your works. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now to him who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, to him his faith is accounted for righteousness. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What is, what is the day of atonement teaching us? It's simply teaching us to stop trusting in what we do. To trust in what Jesus has done and is doing for us. Take away your eyes from you and put them on Christ. There's nothing beautiful to behold in you. The only way you can look at yourself is through the eyes of God. When you have accepted the righteousness of your Savior, then you have a right to look through the eyes of God the proclamations of the scriptures and to realize that now you're a child of God. You've been born again. You are covered in the glorious character of God and God declares you pure, perfect, sinless and He deals with you that you have never seen and He loves you as He loves His own Son, Jesus. Dear friends, we must surrender our works like Paul says and be fair not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is from God the righteousness of faith that is the call of the day of atonement in order to go through the day of atonement you and I must trust in Christ it's so sweet isn't it Friends, it's not about yourself. Isn't that beautiful? It's not about yourself. Can we do something now? Sorry? Can we do something now? Oh, wait a second. <laughs> it's not about yourself. It's about what? It's about Christ Jesus. The work of salvation is not about what you can offer God. But in the work of salvation is what God offers you. Amen? Everything is given to us. Absolutely everything. That's why it's so hard for us to accept it. Because absolutely everything is given to us. And God calls us to cooperate. But the cooperation, friends, the cooperation is, it's, man, it's like someone who's dead cooperating with someone who's living. We are incapable of doing anything. And yet the Lord in His mighty goodness, He works through us, within us and through us. And then once we do something according to His will, He said, man, you've cooperated with me. But in reality, it's Him who has done it in us. Praise the Lord. What is the Lord saying, friends? The day of atonement is God's final call. But it's not God's final call for you to go, Oh, I have to be righteous. I have to be good. I have to start obeying. Oh, I got to give up this and I got to give up that. And, oh, ah, and then you try to, and then once you've given up all those things, now, Lord, bring my name. And you think you're pretty righteous. The difference is the day of atonement is not that call. The day of atonement is a call for you to surrender the Lord to the Lord and turn to Christ with all your heart, with all your soul. So that he can present you before his father faultless. Isn't that beautiful? And the final requirement, and I'll finish with this. Yeah, I have to finish. Is that it, for children of Israel, that day was a Sabbath. But it was not just any Sabbath. It was a Sabbath 
of solemn rest. It has been translated in the King James, King, King James Version tradition. In the original says, it's a Sabbath of Sabbaths. And now this has a dual application. Again, a physical reality and a spiritual reality. In other words, from 1844 onwards, God will have a people who will call the world to keep what day of the week? The Sabbath. But the Sabbath is much more than just a day in which we cease to work physically. The Sabbath teaches lessons that are of deep spiritual um, application that we can carry with us through the week. And the basic lesson is this. Now that you have rested from your works, God assures you that he will provide for you. Isn't that the Sabbath? Every Sabbath? We come to Friday, sunset, we go, oh, I don't have to worry about studying, and I don't have to worry about going to work, and who cares about the bills? It's the day you can go to the bills, and <laughs> that, who cares? True or not? It's the Sabbath. Amen? Well, apply that spiritually to you, and you say, oh, I don't have to be concerned about these things that have failed me and got me by the neck. I have given them to Jesus, therefore I'm resting in him. And because of that, I know that my Father will provide for everything. Amen. Friends, God is leading his people through a narrowing path. And the day will come when we will lose absolutely everything. Because God wants us to learn to trust in Him absolutely. Amen? Do you remember the vision of Mrs. White in which they embarked themselves in a journey and the road was wide and they had a horse and a, and a chariot and a a cart, and they had the cart full of things, and they went along the road, and suddenly the road began to narrow and narrow. They came to a spot where there was a tree, and they couldn't walk with the, with the cart anymore. They only had to take the essentials, and they went on horseback. After a while, they would, the road got narrower and narrower, and oh, we can't go on horse anymore. They couldn't carry the heavy stuff. They left all there, and they went barefooted. I mean, walking. Eventually, they came to the point where ladies had to take their stockings. Because it was very narrow. They eventually, they had to hang from the wall. And the wall was covered in blood. And there was a little cord that hung from heaven. And, and they couldn't see where the cord was hanging. But there were places where they had to hang completely on the cord in order to keep walking. Have you read the, the dream? And they came to a place where there was no more road and just a precipice. And to get to the fair land they were traveling, the only way to do it was to grab that cord who now had become thick. But they couldn't see where it was hanging. And they would run. And, and James White in the dream was the first to do it. He grabbed it and ran and swung himself over the precipice, over a cord that you could not see where it was hanging. And that cord was faith. Absolute trust in God. Let me say to you, dear friend, as we approach the final hours of the Day of Atonement, the Lord wants to give you the Sabbath experience. Not only as a, a day in the week, which is beautiful. In the Sabbath, we rehearse our salvation. We rejoice over the gospel. We celebrate the victory of Christ every seven days. The Sabbath realigns us, refocuses us. Amen? But it is your privilege to carry the Sabbath with you. And the Sabbath... Is the message of the gospel. Stop from your works that I may provide for you. Trust in me and I will be your provider. Do not worry about tomorrow. For your father knows the things you have need of. Amen? Amen. But because we are so <laughs> hard. The Lord has to take us through this road. And he has to narrow the road. Narrow the road. Narrow the road. So that eventually you and I will come to a point where we will trust him. So how do we get ready for the day when our name will come through the judgment? Let me share the story of my brother. I remember it. He was there and he knew he was lost. 
nothing to say. And they read the sentence. He deserves eternal death. And suddenly two men came from a door on this side and they were going to take him, to kill him. And a door opened at the back, flung wide open and says, hold on. My brother turned around, was a young man with a hair up to here. And says, I am willing to die for that man. And the voice came from the judge who says, to what law do you appeal? And he said, to the law of the substitute. There was a little bit of rattling and then he says, yes, it's a true law. You're allowed to do it. And by that time, the young man was next to my uh, brother and he put his arm around him. And then the judge asked, why do you want to do it? And he says, because I love him so much. And so the, the, the guys that came to kill my brother took this young man whose name was Jesus. And they drag him out to the court and my brother followed. They drag him out and says, we want you to see what we'll do to this fella. And when they went out of the court, suddenly the picture changed. And my brother was watching Calvary. He saw Jesus being flogged. He followed him up, the, up to, to the hill. And when they were nailing him to the, 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 the cross, my brother looked into his eyes and says, why are you doing this? And he says, because I do not want you to suffer. And the dream was finished. There is the answer. Do you want to be free from the condemnation that naturally and you deserve it? Do you want to be free? Do you want to be cleared in the judgment? Let Christ be your savior. And you will never go wrong. God bless you. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God and in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for thee. The Lord is coming, are you ready? The Lord is coming, are you ready? ready will your heart be right if he came tonight the Lord is coming are you ready why will you wait my brother Promises of God are all true. Jesus bought your life on Calvary's mountain, and soon he will come again for you. The Lord is coming. Are you ready? The Lord is coming, are you ready? Will your heart be right if he came tonight? The Lord is coming, are you ready? The Lord is coming. Are you ready? I wonder if there's anyone here to, uh, tonight who wants to say to the Lord, Lord, you're coming. I want to be ready. And would you like to leave your bag of stuff and your life at the feet of Calvary and take Christ as your Savior? If that is your desire tonight, to turn away from yourself to Christ, would you stand where you are that we may pray together? Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord.
Amen. My gracious Father, thank you for Jesus. Because he is our assurance, even in the judgment. And now that at this very moment he ministers before us, might before you on our behalf, we turn away from ourselves to Christ. And dear Father, we leave all those things that are separating us from you here at your feet. And we accept Jesus as our Saviour. Lord, you alone know the work that needs to be done in our lives. But we trust that because Christ is our Saviour, he who began in us the good work will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. And we believe that it is God who works in us both to do and to will according to his good pleasure. And that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Therefore, dear Father, we want to thank you for giving us Jesus as our Savior, for forgiving all of our sins and, from, and for taking them from us and for covering us in your glorious, marvelous goodness. And because in this very moment you are declaring us righteous. Dad, now I pray that the peace of heaven will fall upon us. For the promise is that justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.